Grace Bible Church, Pearlside, online. The dumbest question ever asked is if the glass is half empty or half full. Let's face it, we all know it's half full because if there's something in empty, then it's not empty. Pastor Tim Ma shows us a different way to view life's challenges in his message, Seeing the Big Picture, Fighting the Big Battle. Part six of our series, Prevailing Faith, Living at the Next Level. Now that I have four kids, traveling is very difficult to travel off the island. Uh, especially now that, you know, plane tickets, uh, you have to buy, once your child is over two, you have to buy a plane ticket for them. And so being a Chinese man and being not frugal, but wise with my money, it's like, let's just do a staycation. And uh, if you never heard of VRBO, I don't get commission, but it's a, it's a fantastic website to look for uh, places uh, for like beach houses and, and different areas where you can stay. And so we found this great place in Ka'a'ava, and it was right on the beach, like literally the sliding door, when you open it, there's a deck, and then right after the deck um, where you can sit out is the water and the sand, and it's beautiful. And then just like just a few miles off is Chinaman's Hat. Like it's so close, you could swim there. It's, it's, it's that beautiful, and we were enjoying ourselves there. Uh, we booked two nights, and the first day was fantastic. The kids had so much fun. Uh, actually, if you were here last week, Pastor Billy shared a little bit about this story uh, on his experience with Micah getting stung by a Portuguese man of war. So that was the next day. But the first day was, was amazing. It was just me, uh, my wife, and our four kids. And uh, we were swimming all day, having a great time. But then evening came. And with the coming of, of dusk came the uh, mosquitoes. <laughs> yeah, oh, oh no. And then so at first, when we were watching TV at night, uh, we were watching the news, all of a sudden I started to feel my arm get itchy, and then my daughter was complaining about being itchy. So we, we shut the sliding door, because we wanted the sea breeze to just cool us off, and it was nice hearing the ocean, but we had to shut it, because we realized the citronella candle was not working, and that we had, you know, infiltration of mosquitoes coming in to attack us. So we shut the door, and I started to walk around and started to hunt down these mosquitoes. And man, they were bambuchas. For those of you who aren't local here, maybe you're military, we welcome you. Bambucha means ginormous, big, just, just enormous mosquitoes attacking us. And uh, the good thing is it made it easier for, for us to find them because they're not like the mosquitoes that we see here if you live here in uh, Pearl City or Waipahu, Eva. They're, they're nothing like that. Over there, it's like... You know, kahuku, like just giant, big, muscular sp uh, <laughs> mosquitoes just ready to attack. And, uh, and so we thought we got them all, and we were wrong. We went to sleep, and as we were sleeping, I started to feel my head because it, it, it started to feel a little painful and itchy at the same time. And then a, a bump started to emerge, and then my chin, and then right here on my arm, and then I, I look over at my wife, I see her scratching. I'm like, oh no. So I was like, honey, can we turn on the lights? Because I believe we have mosquitoes in the room. And surely enough, like I saw, we found one flying, right? And then when I smashed it against the wall, there was like an explosion of blood. Like I, I told my wife, if we called the blood bank and they were able to just get the blood, that, that would have been able to save someone's life because of how much blood it sucked out of my body. And it was crazy. Like I took a picture um, I mean, I still have, like, this is over a week old, and if, I mean, if you can look at it after service, but <laughs> it, it's still there. But, but uh, initially, it swelled to the size of like a golf ball, like someone implanted a golf ball under my skin, and, um, and it was painful. That's what, like, blew me away. Mosquitoes, I'm used to itching, but these were actually sore, and I was like, what's going on? Because we're on our vacation, we're trying to relax, trying to have a good time, refresh. But at the most inopportune time, here came this attack. And I know, you know, in our lives, um, a mosquito attack might seem light in comparison to some other things that we go through. But I share that story just to set up this, this message today. Because sometimes when we feel like we're doing so good with God, you know, we're on a roll, we feel like our faith is growing, but yet then we encounter opposition. And we wonder, God, are we doing the right things? Why am I hitting an opposition when I feel like I'm doing everything you tell me to do? Well, if you feel like that, you're not alone and you're not doing anything wrong. 
Because when we live at a certain level of faith, it causes us to become a target of attack. And speaking of a target attack, one of my favorite characters in the Old Testament, his life is so fascinating, is the prophet Elisha. And in the Old Testament, God sent prophets to help steer his people whenever they gone astray. Prophets weren't just the mouthpiece of God to speak truth to them, but they were really there to help steer God's people back into relationship with him. And really, as we continue on in this message today, you know, Christianity was never meant to be a religion. The reason why we're here today is not just to become good Christians, but it's to continue to grow in our relationship with God. That's how much God loves us. And as we continue to grow in our relationship with him, we get to see that love magnified in our lives. And so for Elisha, he was doing some amazing things for the kingdom of God, helping the people of God continue to do miracle after miracle, healing a leper, um, turning bad water. I mean, back then, water, the streams, the rivers were the sustenance for entire city, cities and villages. And there's instance before um, our passage today, 2 Kings chapter 6, that we see Elijah doing these amazing miracles of turning bad water into uh, drink, drinkable, healthy, living water once more. Raising the dead, you know, someone's son. And so you think, man, with all these amazing feats and accolades, surely, you know, he deserves a break. But just like my attack at the beach house with mosquitoes and then, you know, poor Micah, Pastor Billy's son with the Portuguese man of war, you know, there's, there's no break when you're living um, at a deeper level of faith. And we're going to explore that a little bit more, but let's first open up in prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for faith. Faith is the bridge, bridgeway that allows us to connect with you, to trust you, to experience your love in our lives. And your word promises that you've given every person a measure of faith. So we pray and declare this morning that, that let that measure grow as your word comes forth. Let it not be my words, but we pray that you speak this morning so that we can hear you. And as we hear you, let faith be stirred and let faith be strengthened in all of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So um, as we look at 2 Kings chapter 6, just to set up the story, we, again, we're, we're looking at Elisha. And Elisha is such an amazing man of God here that he actually is able to pick up the, the plans of the enemy. See, in, in the northern region um, above Israel is the Syrian nation, the Arameans. And they were at war with Israel. And what the Aramean king tried to do was to set up certain camps throughout strategically to try to ambush and to try to uh, thwart and destroy the Israelites, which is God's people in that time. And as, as the king set up these camps, thinking that, okay, victory will be ours, every time the Israelite army was able to, to sidestep and to find ways to go around these ambushes. Now, the, the Aramean, the, the enemy king was confused and perplexed. Why is this happening? And it was because Elisha, the prophet of God, God was actually showing Elisha the specific locations on where the an enemy camps were and where the enemy was hiding. And he was able to inform the Israelite army and king to allow them to have wisdom and success in navigating. And so here is the Aramean king. He's frustrated, and we're going to continue now in verse 12. As he's asking his people, he's thinking, you know, is there an informant? Is there a secret operative in my camp? Because everything that we discuss, these plans to destroy the Israelite, God's people, it keeps on being revealed as if someone is listening in to what we are saying. And so in verse 12, as he's questioning his people, he's thinking he has a spy in his camp. The people, his men respond, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. The go find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. The report came back, he is in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force. They went by night and surrounded the city. So here Elisha is found out and the enemy king is not happy. And the enemy king 
is, uh, sends out this special force to come and capture uh, Elisha. Now, w- two things I, I really want to point out for us to get here is that, first of all, it, it mentions that he didn't just send out a small force, a weak force, but because Elisha was living at the next level, serving God and his kingdom, here the enemy is sending out a strong force. Now, some of us here today, we may feel like there's a strong force out against our lives. We may feel like there's an assignment to take us out, whether it may be at your workplace. You know, you're, you're doing excellent at your job. You're trying to be a light in the darkness wherever you work, trying to be a representative of God and his kingdom and Christ's love to those around you. But yet, for whatever reason, there might be one specific individual or might even be a group of people conspiring against you, saying negative things to you or making you look bad to your supervisor, your boss, and you're wondering, what is going on? It feels like a strong force is coming against me. For some of you, that strong force may be a physical ailment. You feel like you've been eating healthy, you're exercising, but you recently came from the doctors and the prognosis was not good. And you're wondering, what is this strong force coming against my health? It may be a relational issue. You know, you've been praying for your marriage or you're praying for your relationship between your child, for your spouse, for your relative. But it seems like the the more you press in through prayer and, and trying to do your best to allow God, the Spirit of God, to reconcile that relationship, it seems like there's a greater spirit of division that's coming against you, a strong force. And the other factor I want to point out here is that the army was sent in the middle of the night. Just like the army of mosquitoes was sent against me in the middle of the night. I mean, I don't know about you, but sleep is never overrated. Especially being a parent of four now, you know, with with children like constantly coming into my bedroom in the middle of the night, Daddy, I can't sleep, you know, Uh, I got a bad dream. And trying to like squeeze up between my wife and I, little elbows poking my ribs. I got a newborn. She's three months old. I love her. Um, But yet sometimes when she wakes up in the middle of the night, I'm like, Jesus, help me. Right? (laughs) It's good. I cry out to God for help. Yes, amen. And uh, and so that's where we, we, when, when we're coming against these things, it doesn't mean we need to turn back. It doesn't mean we're doing something wrong. But here, this man of God, Elisha, God's very own prophet for entire nation, as he's doing these mighty exploits for God's kingdom, is under attack by a strong force, and this force is coming in the middle of the night. In fact, in Acts chapter 14, 22, it says, we must, so that's all of us in here, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. What's interesting to note is that as we read the New Testament, we look at Jesus' life, we look at Jesus' words, as we become a Christian and we follow him, we dedicate our lives to placing our trust in him, sometimes we think that we deserve a trial-free life, right? Now that I'm, a, I'm saved and I'm a follower of Christ, all my problems should stop, right? On the contrary, never have I seen ever in scripture and if you ever find it you can let me know but there's nowhere in scripture that says that God promises us a trial free life in fact as we just looked at in Acts it's the opposite and so when we come against opposition it doesn't mean we're doing something wrong but it's because we're living at a deeper level of faith and the enemy is not happy about that see there's in the, there's a natural world. Sometimes we encounter natural obstacles, but there's also the supernatural world. And this attack on Elisha, even though it was a natural army coming against him, I wouldn't put, put it past the devil in, se- in manipulating that situation to try, try to send out this physical force to try to put an assault on Elisha's physical life. And so in our lives, you know, as Christians, we should not ever have this entitlement mentality God, I went through so many prayer meetings. I've been going to my grace group every week. I shouldn't have any trials, right, God? Where, as we see in this passage, our lives may very well be on tack because we're living at a deeper level. And so the, our, what is our response? What should it be? Well, seeing through the lens of faith reframes our perspective of who God is. And so as this force is coming against, this physical army of chariots and horses, 
surrounds the city of where Elisha and his servant is, we pick up in verse 15. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, exclamation mark. What shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Wow, let's, let's picture that scene for a moment. You know, picture ourselves as the servant, right? Elisha's servant. We get up, you know, we're probably about to wash our face, but then we hear the, the, the footsteps of horses all around, and we look up and we see this impending army coming to get us. Hence the, oh no, my Lord, right? And, and then Elisha's response, I love it. It's one of calmness. And what is his immediate prayer? Does he immediately pray, God, take away this army. God, stop them from invading us. God, protect us. Because sometimes when we come against armies in our lives, when we come against trials, a temptation, a difficulty, I have a, I, I myself am guilt, guilty of this, but we have a natural tendency to focus more on the invading army, on our problems that are surrounding us, and we feel like we're pressed in on every side. Everywhere we look, we feel like there's something out to get us, someone attacking us, a spiritual force out to thwart us. And what is our prayer? What is our immediate response? For Elisha, he responded properly. The reason why he was calm and at peace, because he knew that around him was the power of God protecting him. And so his immediate prayer was not, God, destroy this army or God, protect us. It was for his servant to see who God is. You fast forward, you know, hundreds of years later when Jesus Christ is on the scene, and we're going to look more about the Lord's Prayer next week in our sermon with Pastor Norman. But in the Lord's Prayer, just to give us a preview, what, what, what does Jesus teach us? How does he teach us to pray immediately? The first thing is to say, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Not hallowed be my name, not it's all about me, God. My kingdom come, my will be done. Although sometimes when we come against issues and problems in our lives, we are so quick to treat God that way. God, you need to help me. God, why is this happening to me? But Elisha, his, his intimacy and his relationship to God, he had such a deep trust in God, he saw who God was. And his immediate prayer was for his servant to be able to see who God is. It wasn't about the problem. It wasn't about the issue. But it's help us, God, to see you for who you are. Let your will be done. Let your kingdom come. God, you are holy. There is none like you. In other words, God, even our, our, our greatest strength is not as strong as your weakness. Even in our greatest intellect and wisdom, as 2 Corinthians declares, it pales in comparison to your foolishness. And so if all the armies of the earth were out to get us, they are subjected to your authority and power, God. And when we realize who God is, when we first focus our eyes on God and not on our issues, it causes us to be just like Elisha, to be able to have the calmness and peace. You know, for those of us who are sitting here today, if we are going through some issues and even as you're trying to receive this word, if there's fear in your life, if there's worry racking your heart, trying to ravage you and cause you to be un at unrest and, and to lack peace, to be in a, a place of anxiety, it's time for us this moment to be able to see God for who he is, to focus our eyes on God and not our issues. Because the more we realize who God is and his power, the, the, the more we realize that God is in control and that we can have the same kind of peace as Elisha. Having an army behind us is so critical, right? For, for 
during that time, the pinnacle of warfare was chariots and horses. And what I love about God is that his chariots and horses were surrounded by fire. So it basically, God is making a statement that even as strong as these forces look that's against you, my power is far superior than anything you can face in your life, any temptation, any trial, any fear that you have. And, uh, you know, just having a, a backup behind us is so important. I remember when I was in high school, um, right as a time I was starting to come to church, I had a group of friends that, um, as, a, as a sophomore in high school, that we were doing some things that weren't the, the best of things, like drinking at cemeteries, egging people at tentless, and uh, we were doing some crazy stuff, and we were troublemakers. And when you make trouble, trouble comes to find you. And the leader of the pack, um, he started to go out with this one girl. This one girl was the ex-girlfriend of, of one of the leaders of a, a, a crew. Crew is like, kind of like gang. A crew in our school called the NWO. NWO was made up of mainly football players. Okay, so even at, though it's Pearl City High School, the football players are still bigger than little Asians and Filipinos that were in our group. And I remember, like, one day, it was just like a normal recess. We're hanging out, and all of a sudden, here comes NWO walking down the hall, kind of like sounding like horses and chariots. That's how big they were. <laughs> I was like, oh, no. Out of all the fishes in the sea, why did you have to go out with his ex-girlfriend? <laughs> And, and so he comes and he starts confronting my, my good friend. And then all these men surrounded us. I call them men because they were like grown men and we were just like adolescent boys. I think some of them might have got held back a few years, that's why. And I thought I was going to die. Fortunately for me, one of those guys in NWO, one of those football players, took typing that year. And I actually helped him in typing class. <laughs> we were friends in typing class. So he comes up to me, like, like as if he was going to um, fight with me. And he's like, okay, in about a few seconds, we're going to start throwing. And I'm going to throw a punch at you. You take the hit and just lay down, okay? I was like, okay, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> but praise God, before anything went down, with all that staring, the chest bumping, the bell rang. I was like, thank you, God, saved by the bell. It's not just a TV show, it's my life. And uh, so we were spared, the whole crew was spared that day. But it, it would have been a whole different situation if it was just that one guy confronting uh, my friend by himself. But because he had a huge army behind him, it was, it, it was scary. And for some of us, we don't realize the backup that God has in our lives, the power of God that's working for us and in favor towards us. And today, one of my prayers as we receive the word is that we get a revelation that God is behind us and God is around us, surrounding us with his love, surrounding us with his grace and power. And we, with that power in our lives, we can come against any obstacle. There is nothing that, that can be thrown at us that we can't overcome with God's power in this life because of Jesus' love in our lives. And it was, it's been over 10 years now. My, um, I remember when I was in L.A. going through college, walking with God, growing in faith in the Lord, um, went up to L.A. to study, but when I got up there, I got this really big heart to help start, start a campus ministry at Cal State Northridge, where I graduated from. And I'm doing these great things, you know, growing with God, and all of a sudden, there's this attack that comes against me in the form of my mom getting sick. One day, while being on the phone with my mom, while she's here um, in Oahu, I'm over in L.A., we we're talking, and I noticed that her tone of her voice was different that day. And so I started to pry, Mom, what's going on? And so finally, she confesses, I just came from the doctor, and now she starts to cry on the phone, and the doctors found cancer cells in my chest. She had breast cancer. And, and so here, the, the tears started to stream even, even more. I could hear her sobbing on the phone. And she starts saying, I don't want to die. You know, I want to see you get married. I want to see you have kids. And at this time, my mom didn't know who God is. I was the first in my family to receive Christ in high school. 
And so I've been praying for my mom for many years at this point, over six years, faithfully, every night, praying for my mom. And because of prayer, because of the word, allowing the word of God to, to give me a different lens, to see the bigger picture, during that moment, it wasn't about, oh, I'll cry with you, mom. I'm so sad. I don't know what we're going to do. It was me being able to see the big picture, and I was able to be an Elisha in her life at that moment. I told her, mom, you know, God loves you, and this is an opportunity for you to experience God's love. And I said, in my room, I still have a Bible, and I want you to read the New Testament about Jesus. And as you read the New Testament, know that Jesus loves you. And after you're reading um, for the day, if you can just cry out to Christ and say, reveal your love to me. Help me to know you. So, so immediately, my response was not so much, God can heal you of cancer, mom. But I, I wanted her to see God for who he is, to see Jesus Christ as her savior. And so she started to do that. And of course, we were praying against the cancer as well. I, I gathered um, the, the men that I was living with, the Christian brothers in, in the house that I was with, and immediately we were in a circle and we were praying against that cancer. But more than that cancer, we were praying for her salvation in her soul. We we're praying that she will be able to know who God is. And so she was faithful in reading the word, uh, I believe daily throughout that whole month. And then when she went back to the doctors where they're gonna begin to see what part they need to cut away, they ran the x-rays one more time and it astounded the doctors that when they looked at the x-ray, there was not a single lump or trace of cancer cell. And so my mom left the hospital that day, called up Pastor Camille, and Pastor Camille led her to the Lord on, on the phone. Praise God. Let's give God a hand for that. In fact, my mom is back there. Mom, can you say hi to everyone? Love you, Mom. She, she's now one of our intercessors at our church. She just loves God. And even though in that moment, I was able to be Elisha in her life, to be able to speak faith, for, to remind her to be able to see God for who he is and allow her to see God for who he is. There's times where she's Elisha in my life. When I'm going through a difficult time, whatever situation I'm in, and I'm sharing with her, she's so quick to pray. And as she's praying, she helps me to keep my perspective uh, on God and not on the problem. And so in our lives, sometimes we can go back and forth, becoming Elisha or becoming the servant. But God has called us to live a lifestyle of that of Elisha, constantly being able to see God for who he is. Because even before Elisha prayed for his servant to be able to see the enemy, he already saw. And for our lives, God's given us the gift of his word. This is not something just for us to hear on a Sunday morning from the preacher or pastor. But we have the opportunity to come before God regularly, daily, to be able to allow our eyes as it becomes fixated on the worldly things and the things that are up against us to refrain it so that we can start to see through the lens and the perspective of who God is. And that's why we uh, talk about grace groups so much because there's times in our lives where we become the servant. And we need men or women in our lives to pray for us, to encourage us to speak the truth of God's word into our hearts so that we can then be able to lift up our eyes and see the chariots of, of fire that God has given us to protect us, to be for us. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 echoes what we've been talking about. For we live by faith and not by sight. There's a saying that, that seeing is believing. I don't know if you heard that phrase before. It's a, it's a common phrase that people use. Seeing is believing. But really, what was going on here in this world for Elisha is believing is seeing. That just because you don't see it doesn't change the existence and the reality of what's happening. Just because the servant couldn't see initially the chariots of fire, God's power and love protecting them, it doesn't change the fact that God was there with Elisha and the servant. You know, um, being married now for almost 10 years, I still dread going into my wife's handbag to look for something. Married men, am I the only one? Right? It's like a, it's like a whole different world in the handbag. And there's times where my, mom, my, my wife's like, can you help grab, you know, this uh, card from my wallet? Or I ask her, honey, you have gum? Oh, it's in my handbag. Oh, no. 
You know, I start to get afraid when she says, it's in my handbag, go and get it. Because I'm in there, I'm like, honey, I don't think you have any more gum. I don't think it's in there. And I'm searching for like minutes and I don't see it and it turns into eternity. I'm like, oh, I give up. There's no gum in there. And then my wife's like, give me my bag. And then boom, in like five seconds, she pulls it out. Just because I didn't see what I was looking for in her bag, it didn't negate the reality and the existence that that was in the bag. And so in our lives, just because we don't see the, the situation being worked out for God's favor in our lives, his will be done, his mercy and grace being shown through us, it doesn't, it doesn't negate the existence of who God is. And so that's so important for us to remember. And as we remember that, we remember to also believe God for victory and allow his grace to move through our lives, through your life. So the resolution to this story as this army, the Arameans are about to capture Elisha and the servant now sees why Elisha is so calm. Verse 18 says, as the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike this army with blindness. So he struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. Elisha told them, this is not the road and this is not the city. Follow me and I will lead you to the man you are looking for. So this is pretty funny. If, if we are able to see this um, happening through a movie or if we place ourselves there, this is comedy, basically. The person they're looking for is actually talking to them. And he's saying, oh, come follow me. I'll help you find the man that you're looking for. And he led them to Samaria. And after they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked and there they were inside Samaria. When the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elisha, shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? Verse 22, do not kill them, he answered. Would you, like, would you kill those you have captured with your own sword or bowl? Set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them and after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away and they returned to their master. So the bands from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. It's amazing. So here, as the army comes to capture Elisha, Elisha prays for this miracle to happen. And, and this blindness that comes upon the army is like being bedazzled where even though they were talking to the man they're trying to capture, they could not recognize Elisha. And Elisha leads this army that's out to kill him, out to capture him, right into the middle of his army, the Israelites. And they're surrounded by the Israelites when they finally can see again. And they think at that point, they're probably thinking, oh, we're done, we're gonna die. But what happens next? Elisha extends grace to his enemies. Instead of beating them, instead of killing them or torturing them, he prepares, he, or he asks the king to prepare a feast for them, for them to be fed, for them to eat, and then they were released without being harmed. Now, in our lives, sometimes when we feel like we're at our wits' ends and we don't know what we're going to do, we need to remember that the reason why we can cry out to God is because we were once enemies of God. But Elisha here is portraying the grace of Jesus Christ. That because of our sin in our lives, in Romans it talks about all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Because of sin of, of, in our lives that separate us from God, Jesus had to come and take away the sins of the world by dying for us and living the life we should have lived. And so when we place our trust in God, we know that God is for us. He's not against us. And that's the beauty of this story here, that Elisha is demonstrating that same kind of grace to his enemies. And so here in this moment, in the story, who we are is we we're once enemies of God. And the reason why we know we can cry out to God and he's for us is because he didn't even spare his own son to sacrifice for us. So if God would not even spare his own son to die for us, how much more so would he get us through any financial situation? Now, the outcome might not be what we expected because, you know, for the servant, I'm sure he's thinking, oh, these guys are going to get it once he saw the chariots of fire. 
They're probably going to just burn up, and God's going to incinerate them. But yet, his servant's jaw probably dropped to the ground as Elisha said the words, let's feed them and then release them. So sometimes in our situation, when we're going through things, it might not turn out the way we think. But when we trust God and we live a life of faith, and we know that God is surrounding us with his love, surrounding us with his power, we know that we will never be defeated. But God is a God of victory. That's the God we serve. And when we allow God's victory to fill our hearts, we never have to lack faith and confidence in him. You know, as we close this morning, um, there's a movie that just came out called, the, called Captive. And uh, it's based on a true story of Ashley Smith. Pastor Norman um, last year used this story in an illustration, but with the release of the movie and in light of this message, it's, it's appropriate for us to revisit her story. It's been about 10 years now, on March 11, 2005, where Ashley's life was down in the gutter. She watched her husband brutally murdered in front of her, and because of that, she spiraled into a meth addiction that she could not break out of. She lost her daughter um, in a custody battle because she was an unfit mom. And she was having such a hard time in life. And in that moment, on that day, that fateful day that forever changed her life, there was a man, Brian Nichols, as he is awaiting trial for a a rape case that he was um, accused of. He steals the sheriff's gun, goes into the courtroom that he was going to appear before, kills the judge and a courtroom reporter, and then injures many other people along the way as he escapes the courtroom steals a car, and parks his car in front of Ashley Smith's house. And here, these two lives, they cross paths, and she was held captive for seven hours. Let's watch the trailer to see what happens. Mommy. (laughs) Hey, baby girl. I love you. I love you, too. I'll send my prayers for you. I hate this car. I lost everything. My husband's dead, and they said I was an unfit mother. Took away my little girl. Have you heard of this book? Help me. You're late, Ashley. Lady dropped this off for you. When I heard I had a son. Choppers up now. Let's flush Nichols out. My name is Ashley Smith. I'm a mother. I don't trust you, Ashley. He's skin again, and I will have to kill you. I need to see my daughter. You're not going anywhere. God, please help me. You call me out upon. What is that? What are you doing? Just a book. Read it to me. If you want to know why you were placed on this planet, you must begin with God. And he expects you to make the most of what you have been given. I haven't been given anything. You have a son. Christopher, it's your daddy. You're going to hear some bad things about me. Whatever happens, I love you, little man. The greatest tragedy is not death, but life without purpose. I don't know, but maybe God can. Romans 2 4 says, God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. If we can all stand in response to his word, you know, for Ashley Smith, she was surrounded by a physical force, Brian Nichols, who was looking to harm her. She was captured for seven hours but also the spiritual addiction and and the darkness of her past life of her meth addiction. But despite this, in that moment, she chose to lift her eyes up above the waves of the situation surrounding her. And she chose to see God and his love and his power and declared it and allowed her to break free of that situation. She's been drug free now since that day. And of course, she's living in well. As we close, before we go back into worship, 
I'm going to read from Romans chapter 8. And in this passage, it talks about God's amazing love. See, it's not just the chariots of fire and the horses that surround our lives which proclaim God's power, but it's also realizing that that power is also intertwined with God's love. Sometimes we feel like I can't cry out to God because I'm not worthy. That's exactly the situation that Ashley Smith was in. This drug addict that lost her husband and lost her daughter, it was an unfit mom. And I'm sure in that moment, as she was held captive for seven hours, she was thinking, am I even worthy to cry out to God? But the amazing thing about God's grace is that it's not something that we earn, but it's something we receive. So as we close with Romans 8, I want you to receive that grace into your life right now. And as you do, know that God loves you and that you are worthy to receive his power and love working in your life. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We don't have to wonder if God loves us. It's all echoed through eternity with the finished work on the cross. <laughs>